All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Saad Ali. I am an engineer at Google and co-chair of SIG Storage. I'm really, really excited to be here in Barcelona, Barcelona and see all of you. Um, today, I want to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, Kubernetes storage. So by now, I think most of you are aware of the benefits of Kubernetes. You've heard of a lot of uh, folks running uh, large-scale production clusters. Kubernetes offers a lot of functionality, a lot of features, self-healing, intelligence, scheduling, auto-scaling, portability, and so much more. But time and time again, the question arises, what about stateful workloads? Is Kubernetes a good place to run stateful workloads? There's still uncertainty. And the fact is that containers are inherently stateless. Anything that you write into your container file system is going to be gone as soon as that container is terminated. But for your stateless apps, you need your bits to not disappear when the container dies. So what are your options? If you go looking for advice online, you're going to run into a lot of misinformation. Specifically, you're going to hear a couple of tropes. One is that Kubernetes storage is hard. And two is that don't run your stateful workloads on Kubernetes. So while I'm going to try to separate fact from fiction, I don't want to sugarcoat things. I like this quote from uh, Tim Hawkins. He's one of the best engineers I know. And he says that storage is hard, maybe the hardest of infrastructure problems. And the fact is that storage, independent of Kubernetes, is a complicated problem. Storage can encompass a lot of things. Everything from consuming block and file storage from a pod running on Kubernetes to deploying a database on Kubernetes using Kubernetes primitives, to deploying a software-defined storage system on top of Kubernetes, and much, much more. Part of the problem is that there is a misunderstanding of what Kubernetes is responsible for, what it's capable of. Uh, here's another quote that I uh, like from the great Kelsey Hightower. Basically, what it boils down to is sprinkling Kubernetes on hard problems won't make them go away. And this is especially true for storage. So one of my goals uh, today is to leave you with a more realistic understanding of what's possible for stateful workloads on Kubernetes. So I think we've established that storage is a complicated problem, but we know how to solve complicated problems. We apply the separation of concerns design principle. The idea is that. You want to isolate, revise, and test each component indep independently. This uh, concept allows you to take a larger system and make it more modular so you can easily swap out components. And most importantly, it lets you handle large problems by breaking them down into smaller, more manageable pieces. So let's apply this principle to storage. You can break storage down into four sub-problems. The first is selecting what storage you should be using. The second is figuring out how you should deploy that storage. The third is figuring out how you're going to integrate that storage with your Kubernetes cluster. And then finally, once it's integrated, how does your stateful application actually consume that storage? So while Kubernetes doesn't explicitly handle each of these problems, it does introduce abstraction layers that actually enable you to handle these as separate problems. And in fact, you could handle them, you could have different uh, sub-teams within your organization handle them, a cluster administrator versus an application developer. Prior to Kubernetes, all of these problems were conflated together because it was very difficult to handle them independently. For example, if your app was consuming, say, a block storage from a software-defined storage system, and you wanted to switch it over to a block, system, uh, a block storage from an external appliance, it would require you to either modify your app or, at the very least, the deployment scripts for your app that are responsible for provisioning storage and attaching it and mounting it and all of these things. With Kubernetes, we have new abstractions that enable you to handle these piece by piece. 
So let's walk through this. So let's say you have a stateful app. The first question is, where do you persist the bits? You have a lot of options. Here are some of the places your applications can store bits. Each one of these categories is optimized for different types of data, different access patterns. Uh, and in addition, each one of these categories has a lot of options. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. This is the most challenging part. You have to, you have to, uh, you have to choose. And the way that you do that is first by understanding what options are available to you and what the differences between them are. You have to educate yourself. Next, make sure to understand what the requirements for your application are. What are the, what's the kind of data that you're going to be storing? How are you going to be accessing it? Where will you be accessing it from? All of these things are going to factor into the type of storage that you're going to select. Next, you have to weigh the trade-offs between, between the different options. Storage is generally a trade-off between availability, durability, and cost. To learn more about these trade-offs, check out uh, a talk that my colleague Michelle O oh is giving this afternoon called Improving Availability for Stateful Applications. Finally, you have to make a decision. It can be pretty overwhelming, but the reality is that Kubernetes won't solve this for you. You have to do your homework. Sprinkling Kubernetes doesn't magically make it so you don't have to architect your application. So now you've selected your storage. The next step is how do you actually deploy it? First, uh, let's divide storage into managed and unmanaged solutions. A managed solution is one run by somebody else. For example, a cloud provider on Google, we have Cloud SQL uh, as a managed database, GC persistent disks as managed block storage. With managed solutions, you don't have to worry about how you deploy or manage the storage system because somebody else is taking care of that for you. And it's perfectly OK to do this with Kubernetes. Even if your storage is deployed and managed outside of Kubernetes, your Kubernetes cluster can still consume that storage from within your Kubernetes cluster. If you don't depend on a managed solution, then you're responsible for deploying and managing the storage yourself. And you have a few options again. You may choose to deploy your storage within Kubernetes or outside of Kubernetes. And this is one of the keys that I want you to take away from this talk, is that the deployment and consumption of storage are independent problems. So it's perfectly OK to deploy your storage outside of Kubernetes while you consume it within Kubernetes. For block and file, for example, you may have a dedicated external storage appliance that you're using for your storage, and that's OK. For data services, you may have a legacy database that's already running on some VMs. And it's OK to leave them there. You don't have to deploy your storage on Kubernetes in order to use it. But you may choose to deploy your storage on top of Kubernetes. And if you do, then it becomes just another stateful application that you're deploying on top of Kubernetes. Yesterday, uh, David Zhu and Jan Shefernick from Red Hat gave a great uh, tutorial about deploying stateful workloads on Kubernetes. Check that out if you're interested in the details of exactly how you deploy stateful applications. But the key here is that when you deploy storage on Kubernetes, it's just like deploying any other storage, uh, any other stateful application on Kubernetes. Now, stateful apps uh, like databases can get fairly complicated, and they can have very complicated life cycles. Uh, for example, a database may have custom scale-out logic that replicates the data and may have special steps that it needs when it needs to be upgraded. Kubernetes doesn't know how to handle that. Brian was talking about how Kubernetes is not the end. Kubernetes gives you the primitives that you can use to build higher level functionality. And this is where Kubernetes operators come in. Kubernetes operators are CRDs, custom resource definitions, and controllers that manage the deployment and lifecycle of your application. 
So if you have a sufficiently complicated application, which is especially true for a lot of stateful workloads, what you want to do is look for an operator for the type of stateful app that you're deploying to make it easier to deploy and manage that application. So again, the recommendation here is if you have a sufficiently complicated stateful application, use an operator. I want to call out specifically uh, deployments of software-defined storage systems on Kubernetes. This is where I hear a lot of confusion. Um, software-defined storage systems are basically software that aggregates disks across a cluster and exposes durable storage on top of those uh, disks. So for example, Ceph and Gluster are open source examples, and there are a bunch of proprietary variants. We have to remember that you can choose to deploy your software-defined storage system on top of Kubernetes, or you could choose to deploy it outside of Kubernetes. Regardless, you can consume that storage within Kubernetes uh, without issue, regardless of where you deploy it. And like any other uh, storage or stateful uh, application, if you do choose to deploy your software-defined storage on top of Kubernetes, it's just another stateful app which means that you're probably going to deploy it using an operator. All right, so one uh, operator that is a great example of this is Rook. Rook handles um, Ceph as well as a handful of other storage systems. Um, Ceph is a software-defined storage system that lets you consume local disks and expose block or file storage. To find out more about Rook, check out a, a talk this afternoon by Jared Watts. He actually has a number of talks on Rook, uh, and uh, you can find out all about, uh, all about Rook through those talks. So once you've deployed your storage, the next challenge is how do you actually make it available within your Kubernetes cluster? Now, before we talk about integration, let's simplify our storage options. This is a lot to take in. We've been throwing around a lot of buzzwords. I talked about a lot of example, story, uh, example categories before. Let's divide them into two areas, data services and block and file storage. Uh, by doing so, a pattern begins to emerge. Your stateful applications may depend on data services or directly on block or file storage. Your data, your data services, in turn, may themselves depend on another data service, or they may depend on block or file. But eventually, somewhere, something needs to write to disk. Something needs to be able to persist those bits to a physical medium, maybe flash or a spinning disk. And that's what makes block and file the turtle at the bottom. Uh, it's where the rubber meets the road, or where the bits uh, land on the disk. So with that clarification, let's move on. Your storage system is now up and running. It might be running in Kubernetes. It might be deployed outside of Kubernetes. Either way, it's OK. Now, how do you actually integrate that storage into your Kubernetes cluster? Let's talk about data services first. Data services, whether they're managed by you or managed by somebody else, your app has to have logic to be able to discover the API endpoints. Uh, it has to be able to negotiate auth. You have to have basically some sort of SDK within your application that knows how to interact and discover this storage system. For block and file, this is where Kubernetes really begins to shine. For block and file, integration is a cluster level operation. Kubernetes supports an extension mechanism called the container storage interface. CSI enables Kubernetes to integrate any block or file storage system with Kubernetes. And to integrate, all you have to do is deploy a CSI driver on your Kubernetes cluster. A CSI driver is just another Kubernetes workload. So it doesn't really matter where your storage was deployed as long as uh, you have it deployed somewhere, your Kubernetes cluster can access it, you're good to go. So specifically with block and file, this also highlights uh, another advantage of Kubernetes, portability. You can actually swap out your block and file storage system without ever having to modify your application. 
So for example, without Kubernetes, if you decided to change from one block of file storage to another, you had to rewrite your app or change your deployment uh, scripts in order to uh, adapt this new, new um, storage system. With Kubernetes, all you have to do is deploy a CSI driver and create a new storage class. Your app and its deployment YAML never change. Once you've deployed your application, you, uh, you have to make it available on your cluster. So this is the last step. How are stateful applications actually going to use the storage that you've deployed now that it's integrated within your cluster? For data services, whether they're managed or unmanaged, either your administrator has to provision the storage, uh, or you'll have to do it yourself as an as application developer. But your app has to take responsibility for it. Your app has to have the SDK or the bits that are responsible for being able to read and write to that data service. For block and file storage, it becomes much easier. Uh, with the Kubernetes storage API, you have persistent volume claims, persistent volumes. And what they allow you to do is consume block and file storage in a portable manner. Now, I'm not going to go into details of what uh, persistent volume and persistent volume claims and storage class objects do or how they work. Uh, there's a great talk by David Zhu this afternoon, uh, Storage 101. I recommend that you check that out if you're interested in the details. But let me talk about the high-level benefits of using Kuber the Kubernetes storage API versus deploying without Kubernetes. If you deploy without Kubernetes, first you have to manually provision uh, a volume on your storage system. Then you have to figure out how to attach that volume to the node that you want to run your workload on. Then you have to mount that volume into the container in order to make it available inside that container. And we uh, heard from Spotify and others how your uh, cluster may go down. Things are necessarily going to fail. And when that happens, what do you do? You're going to have to have some sort of monitoring that's going to have to notice that this, your nodes are down move your workloads, and then go in and manually move your storage over. This is unsustainable. So with Kubernetes, everything is automatic. Stor storage is automatically intelligently provisioned. We figure out where your, the best place in the cluster is to provision not just your workload, but also your storage. Your workload is intelligently scheduled based on that storage. The storage is automatically made available to the correct node and pod, and of course, when a, a node goes down, that storage is automatically moved with the workload to a working node. So let's wrap things up. The reality, of course, is that storage is complicated. And the way that we make complicated things more manageable is by breaking them down into smaller problems. For storage, we are able to break, uh, break it down into four pieces, selecting your storage, deploying that storage, integrating it with your Kubernetes cluster, and then consuming it. While Kubernetes doesn't solve everything, it does introduce new abstractions that let you handle these problems piece by piece. It allows your storage administrators to focus on storage deployment. It lets your cluster administrators figure out how to integrate with that storage system. It lets your application developers focus on consuming that storage from their application. The separation of responsibility makes, Kubernetes, makes uh, storage manageable within Kubernetes. And that is all. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>